program is proud to welcome Mr. Robert Resha, South African national leader. For years now, Mr. Resha has been associated with Nobel Peace Prize winner Albert J. Latuli in the fight against racism. He's presently on tour in order to acquaint Americans more closely with conditions as they presently exist in South Africa. Following Mr. Resha's presentation, there will be an informal coffee hour and discussion period in Student Union 2412. Now it gives me great pleasure to introduce Mr. Robert Resha, who will be speaking on the struggle against racism in South Africa. Mr. Resha. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, it is indeed a great pleasure on my part to be with you this afternoon. Time allowing, I would have preferred that we come together and discuss apartheid and discuss racism rather than my talking to racism about you. We maintain that every serious thinking individual in this world, wherever he or she may find himself or herself, is a participant in the struggle against racism. South Africa is a land of contrast. It is one country in the world today where racial discrimination, white supremacy, exploitation of the African people is enshrined in the Constitution. South Africa is one country in the world where the inhabitants of a country are divided into various groups. In spite of the fact that South Africa is a multiracial country in that it has 12 million Africans, one and a half million white people, three and a half million white people rather, one and a half million colored people. In South Africa we refer to colored as people of a mixed race and half a million Indians. You would therefore come to the conclusion that the population in South Africa consists of 17 million people. But in terms of apartheid, this is not so. Apartheid laws has divided South Africa into a people, a non-people, neither no people nor non-people. When you speak of a people, in so far as South Africa is concerned, you are referring only to three and a half million whites, among whom are those people who came to South Africa some 300 years ago, white people who consider that they themselves and themselves alone constitute a superior race that they went to South Africa on a mission, on a divine mission to civilize the African people. These people have been in South Africa for over 300 years and they continue to repeat this statement that they were sent there by God to go and civilize the African barbarians. What of course is interesting to some of us, having not met God to find out of course whether he did send them or not, but what is interesting is here is a group of people, a people who have a divine mission to civilize us. They have been there for 300 years and not one of them thinks it is his duty or the duty of those people ever to go back to God to report as to whether they have succeeded or failed in their mission. Instead of doing this, what we see in South Africa today, 
that they are entrenching themselves. They have taken 87% of the land and have crowded the African people within the 13% of the land. They are making laws which are making it absolutely impossible for any other person who is not white to live happily in that country. In an effort to entrench themselves further, they are now engaged in a desperate and frantic arms build-up, increasing the white-only army at the rate of 10,000 men per year, buying from the Western world the most modern and devastating weapons of war. And all this is being done by people who said they went to South Africa on a divine mission. In order to entrench themselves and to pursue their policies of apartheid, only the white people constitute a people on the surface of South Africa. When you speak of a majority, when you speak of a population, insofar as South Africa is concerned, you are referring only to the three and a half million people. Only a few days ago, on the 30th of March, there were general elections in South Africa who were voting only the white people. So that when you get the New York Times and other papers in this country saying that Dr. Fairfoot's party won the election by an overwhelming majority, it means an overwhelming majority of the white people alone. In South Africa, the African people have no vote. The colored people have no vote. The Indian people have no vote. The right to administer that country is the preserve of the white skin. They are the people who must shape the destiny of that country. The African people, 12 million of them, the indigenous people of that land, are not considered as a people. They constitute a non-people. Most of the laws that govern that country do not apply to the African people. The African people are not considered a people at all. In so far as the government and white society is concerned, the African people have not been born in South Africa. They do not exist. To know whether or not there is an African in South Africa, you have to go through the legislation that has been enacted in the country for the simple purpose of controlling the African people. The African people are the only group in the country who are governed by a law known as the Pass Law. In terms of that law, as I've said, the African does not exist. The African is not born. In South Africa, my name is not Robert Hersher, for I'm not a human being. No white man wants to know what my name is. No policeman cares to know my name. If a white man stops me in the street, he never asks me what my name is, for he does not believe I'm capable of giving him my name. And if I were to give him my name, he does not believe that I'm telling the truth. So in order to know whether an African has a name or not, in order to know where an African lives and works in South Africa, the past law had to be brought into operation. In terms of the past law, every African from the age of 15 years must carry a pass. This is the document that determines the life of the African people in South Africa. This is the law that controls the African from the cradle to the grave. When a policeman stops any African in South Africa, his question is simple. 
Where is your pass? When we have produced your pass, it is that document which must say who your name is, where you were born, where do you work, how much you get. Simply put, without a pass in South Africa, an African does not exist. Without a pass, you cannot get employment anywhere. Without a pass, you cannot move from one area to the other. Without a pass, you cannot get married. Without a pass, you cannot get a permission to dig a grave for your friend, for your neighbor, for your son, or for your daughter. As if this is not enough, the government still wants to get the pass of the deceased. So far as the government is concerned, no African has died if you cannot produce the pass. Robert Hesha has not died. What the government wants to know is, reference book number 9050 is from this day unattached. This is how you count the numbers of the African people. One passbook unattached signifies that an African has died or something has happened to him. Of course, the African people in South Africa do not accept the past laws. They have organized themselves to fight against the past laws. Because as a result of this law, half a million Africans are arrested and convicted every year. To stop the African people from struggling for their rights, all political organizations of the African people in South Africa have been outlawed. It is an offense in South Africa to belong to a political organization. No political meetings of any nature are allowed in South Africa. In fact, there are today hundreds of people who are languishing in the jails of South Africa, and they have been charged for being members of unlawful organizations. In terms of this law, the onus to prove innocence is on the accused. What the government does today through its security police is to move about in the streets of Johannesburg, of Durban, of Cape Town, and watch people as they move. If you walk astride, or you walk fast or slow, you do window shopping. This might give an idea to a member of the security branch if you have got big red eyes, he might think you ought to be a member of the African National Congress. You ought to be a member of the Pan-Africanist Congress. Therefore, you are arrested. When we appear before the magistrate, the indictment is simple. That we are being accused for being a member of an unlawful organization. And the onus is on you to prove your innocence. I have no intention to insult you this afternoon, but I do want to say this, that not one of you in this meeting would be capable to prove your innocence. If any one of you were to find himself in Johannesburg today, and you were arrested and charged for being a member of the African National Congress, what would be your plea? Your plea would be a simple and an honest one. I am not a member of the African National Congress. I was never a member of the African National Congress. The learned magistrate will say to you, prove it. How could you prove it? Hence, there are hundreds of our people languishing in jail. 
because it is true that when you are not a member of the African National Congress, you are not. And you can do nothing by way of trying to prove the truth. I have been trying to consider for myself what my plea would be if I was not a member of the African National Congress. It seems to me the only way of proving this would be to go to the African National Congress, join the African National Congress, and get a ticket, and then resign from the African National Congress and demand that they give me a ticket to prove that I'm not a member. Otherwise, how can I prove it? There is, of course, even a danger there. Because by going to the African National Congress, I'll also be playing the role of being an informer. I'll have to tell the magistrate, where are the offices of the African National Congress? Who gave me the ticket? And the person who signed my discharge will be guilty of being a member of the African National Congress. So that the law is so made that no African must escape the net. Everyone must be found guilty. To suppress all activities of the African people and even to convict those who have not spoken, who are merely thinking, you have the Anti-Sabotage Act. In terms of this act, by what you do and say and think, you may be charged for sabotage and if convicted there is a minimum of five years and the maximum of death how does the government know that people are planning or are in fact committing sabotage quite apart from those who are engaged in subversive activities if you write on the wall that African children want education. That, in terms of this act, is an act of sabotage. The prosecution will argue that you are inciting the African people to revolt against the government. You are conspiring to overthrow the government by force and violence. If you are known to have been active politically, or you are a member of a trade union, and you enter a factory in South Africa without the permission of the owner or of the manager, you can be charged for intention to commit sabotage. And the onus is on you to prove that when you enter that factory, you had no such intentions even if you are called upon to write a thesis on your intention not to commit sabotage, you would never be able to prove to the South African judge that that was not your intention. The fact that at one time or another you are active in the trade union movement and you end a factory, it is argued that your intention was to commit sabotage. As a result of this travesty of justice, Thousands of our people are languishing in jail. What about the colored people and the Indian people? They constitute neither the people nor the non-people. They are just pawns on a large draft board who can be moved to and fro, hither and thither, depending on the whims and fancies of the powers that be. At one time, the colored people are regarded, because they are of a mixed race, as appendages of the white. At another time, they are the unfortunate, illegitimate sons of the white people. At another, they are colors. Twelve years ago, the South African government decided that it must do something about this race called the colored race 
they had decided to call them colors to start with. But they had decided that this race must be investigated and the law was passed known as the Reclassification Act. The government had to go into pains in finding out who is a colored and who is not a colored. Many people who had considered themselves colored were declared Africans. Because various tests were implemented. If They put a needle onto your body and by way of feeling pain you exclaimed and say, oh, you are an African. If you said, hiya, you are a colored. If they touch your nose, and there was a bone or no bone that determined what race you belong. If they put a pencil on your head and it doesn't stick or sticks, that determines your race. As for the Indian people, everything has been done in the country to strangle them economically in the hope that on their own they will go to India, they will go to Bombay, they will go to New Delhi. So that you find a group of people who don't seem to belong anywhere. For the white people have allocated to themselves 87% of the land. 12.9 is given to the African people. And the colored and the Indian people have nowhere to live. Each municipality, each city decides at a given time that 13 miles, 20 miles out of the city, they will build a ghetto for the Indians. They will build a ghetto for the colored people. In all this, therefore, you find racism at work. You'll find that everything is being done to maintain white supremacy. Everything is being done to divide the people of South Africa into people, non-people, and what have you. What then is the reaction of the African people? In what way do the African people feel they ought to exist, they ought to fight. The struggle of the African people within this setup dates as far back as 1912. For 10 years before that, the British government decided that South Africa should become a union of South Africa. Simply put, a union of white people against the African people. For those who had to administer South Africa from 1910, were to be the British and the Boers. Immediately this happened, the African people realized that one of the things which led to their defeat in their many wars against the white invaders was that they fought the white people as single different tribes. They did not fight the white people as a nation. And therefore, when they formed an organization, the African National Congress, its main task was to weld together the different African tribes into a one single united nation capable of struggling for the rights of the African people. From its inception, the African National Congress accepted the fact that South Africa was a multiracial country, whether the African people liked it or not. It was a multiracial country, whether the African people accepted it or not for they are the groups I've already referred you to. Faced with this situation, the African leaders then, like the African leaders today, maintain that the only policy that could bring about happiness and prosperity in that country is the creation of a non-racial 
society, a society which will accept everyone as a South African if he lives in that country and he considers the country his own. Thus, the constitution of the African National Congress begins with the preamble that South Africa belongs to all those who live in it, black and white, and no government shall be considered representing the people of South Africa unless it was elected by all on the basis of one man, one vote. We also had to consider how we're going to bring this about. The African National Congress was of the view that a non-violent method of struggle would perhaps be the best to bring this about. Consequently, over the last 54 years, the policy of the African National Congress has been one of non-violence. But the powers that be, this race of white superiors, these men who have a divine mission, consider a policy of non-violence, cowardice, weakness on the part of the African people. Hence the organizations have been banned. Hence their leaders have been arrested, confined to certain areas, not allowed to speak at meetings and placed under house arrest. By these actions, the government was trying to demonstrate to the African people that you cannot be non-violent and hope to succeed. We shall visit every peaceful method of your struggle every non-violent non action with violence. Consequently, intimidation, terror, and violence have become the order of the day in South Africa. This is the only language white society is prepared to use when talking to the African people. Perhaps I should pause here to say this that when the African National Congress decided to follow a policy of non-violence, it was not a sign of weakness nor cowardice on their part, for they know that the African people in South Africa have a glorious record, unsurpassed in those who have fought for the freedom of their country. We fought the white invaders in the battlefield and were defeated in the battlefield. South Africa is one country in the continent of Africa where there was never an armistice, where there was no peace treaty, so far as the African people are concerned. There has been a truce. And either side, some date, will have to go back to the battlefield to settle the scores. Perhaps it is for this reason that the government is now provoking violence because it has armed itself to the teeth. But we decided on non-violence, having accepted that South Africa was a multiracial country. We feared that a violent struggle will inflict wounds on the society, which for a long time would remain a festering sore and make it impossible for black and white to live together. But the present regime says, back to the battlefield. That is where we shall settle this cause. The African people have been left in no choice. The struggle is no longer in our own hands. We are not given the opportunity to decide whether or not non-violence will succeed tomorrow. All peaceful methods have been closed. And we are now preparing ourselves to meet force with force. We have no alternative. The African peasants say to us, you will never change the mind of the white man. He fought for this country and he defeated us in the battlefield. If you want it back, go there and buy it with your blood. That is the unhappy situation in South Africa. But suppose we're going to do this. We will not be fighting the white people alone in South Africa. South Africa has become an international center. 
There are many countries of the world today which are involved in the struggle in which you are engaged in. This country, the United States of America, Britain, France, Belgium, Western Germany, Japan, have entered the arena of conflict in South Africa on the side of the whites. They are investing in the country. They are having trade with South Africa. They are selling the best military weapons to the South African government, full knowing that these arms will be used against the African people. They are investing in a country in which they get huge profits because of the exploitation of the African labor. Ford Motors, General Motors, Chrysler Motors and Coca-Cola have industries, factories in that country. They too don't employ Africans unless they have passes. They too arrest Africans who go on strike because the law of the country is so determined. They too do not employ Africans to do skilled work because it is against the law of the country. But they are there because out of the blood and sweat of the African worker, they get their profits. We fear, therefore, that in the event of a violent clash, the interest of these industrialists will prevail. They will find it easier than ourselves, indeed, easier than you, to go to Johnson and say the South African barbarians, those black niggers, are making life impossible for us. They have blown sky-high Ford Motors. They have killed five American technicians. Therefore, it is the duty of this powerful state, the United States of America, to repeat what it did in Stendaville, to send its planes and paratroopers, not to kill the African people, but to protect the American nationals. We fear this is likely to happen. And my people have asked me to plead with the people of this country to popularize the situation in South Africa and to use pressure on their government to impose sanctions against South Africa. If your government finds it more difficult to pull out its investment, which is a peaceful method, because they do not want to be associated with apartheid, we fear that when there is bloodshed, you will have more reasons for remaining inside. And your technicians, your industrialists, will not be able to remain in South Africa without being armed, without asking for the protection of the South African government. We are asking you to give us this assistance. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Mr. Rasher, for that very enlightening speech. I'd like to remind you all once again that there'll be a coffee hour and discussion period in room 2412. Thank you.